Protestants, but they became popular among European elites in the 1600s because they bolstered the power of the church, justified the capitalist exploitation of labor and nature, and gave moral license to colonization. Even the very idea of reason itself came to rely on these assumptions. Humans alone have reason, Descartes argued, because we alone have minds. And the first step of reason is to realize that we, our minds, are separate from our bodies and separate from the rest of the world. From this perspective, the animist insistence on seeing the world as intimately interconnected was long regarded as irrational and unenlightened. In the 19th century, prominent anthropologists described it as childish. Only children see the world as enchanted. But this is a cognitive error that we must correct. Indeed, not only reason, but modernity itself and modern science came to be defined as the ability to recognize the difference between humans and nature, subject and object. Animism provided the perfect foil for the emerging concept of the modern. But Descartes didn't have the last word. Even as the ink was drying on his manuscripts, he came under attack from his own contemporaries who pointed out fundamental errors in his work. And over the 400 years since then, advances in scientific research have proved not only that Descartes was wrong, but that animist thought is, in key respects, more resonant with how life and matter actually work. The backlash against Descartes started with a brave Dutch philosopher by the name of Baru Spinoza. Spinoza grew up in a Sephardic Jewish family in Amsterdam in the 1600s, just as Descartes was becoming a celebrity. But while the elites of the day fawned over Descartes' dualism, Spinoza wasn't convinced. In fact, he took exactly the opposite view. Spinoza pointed out that the universe must emerge from one ultimate cause, what today we might recognize as the Big Bang. Once we accept this fact, Spinoza argued, then we have to accept that while God and souls and humans and nature might seem to be fundamentally different kinds of entities, they are really just different aspects of a single grand reality, a single substance, and governed by the same forces. This has radical implications for the way we think about the world. It means that God ultimately participates in the same substance as creation. It means that humans participate in the same substance as nature. It means that mind and soul are the same substance as matter. In fact, it means that everything is matter. Everything is mind. And everything is God. These ideas were heretical at the time. No souls? No transcendental God? Spinoza's teachings upended the core tenets of religious doctrine and threatened to pry open difficult moral questions about the exploitation of nature and labor. After all, if nature is ultimately the same substance as God, then humans can hardly claim dominion over it. The backlash was swift and severe. Spinoza ran so against the grain of establishment thinking at the time that he found himself at the sharp end of brutal persecution. The Jewish authorities in Amsterdam issued a harem against him, expelling him from the community. The Christian establishment threw him out too, and the Catholic Church went so far as to list his works in the Index of Forbidden Books. His own family shunned him, and he suffered physical assault on the streets. At one point, he was stabbed on the steps of a synagogue by an assailant shouting, Heretic! But none of this deterred him. Spinoza kept the torn cloak he was wearing when stabbed and wore it as a symbol of defiance. Europe faced a fork in the road. They had two options, the path of Descartes or the path of Spinoza. With the full backing of the church and capital, Descartes' vision won out. It gave legitimacy to the dominant class forces and justified what they were doing to the world. As a result, today we live in a culture shaped by dualist assumptions. But it could have been otherwise. 
I often find myself wondering how things might have turned out differently if Spinoza's perspective had prevailed instead. How would this have shaped our ethics, our economics? Perhaps we wouldn't now be facing the nightmare of ecological collapse. What's so striking about this story is that, over the centuries that followed, scientists affirmed a number of Spinoza's claims. They affirmed that there is in fact no fundamental distinction between mind and matter, that mind is an assemblage of matter, just like everything else. They affirmed that there is no fundamental distinction between humans and non-human beings, that humans and non-humans evolved from the same predecessor organisms, and they affirmed that everything in the universe is ultimately governed by the same physics, even if that physics has yet to be fully described. Ironically, for a school of thought that was once considered the height of Enlightenment science, dualism ended up suffering a tremendous defeat at the hands of science itself. Indeed, today the tables have turned. Spinoza is now routinely recognized as one of the best thinkers in modern European philosophy and celebrated as a key figure in the history of science. And yet, even as science broke from dualism, some of Descartes' assumptions about the world lingered on. To this day, most people in Western societies still believe that humans are fundamentally set apart from the rest of nature. To justify this belief, religious people might fall back on some notion of the soul, Atheists, for their part, will insist that it has something to do with intelligence or consciousness. Only humans, they'll say, have an inner self and the capacity to reflect on the world, and this is what makes us superior to other beings. Only humans are real subjects, while other beings are objects in our field, mechanically playing out their lives according to genetic codes. 400 years later, and we're still retweeting Descartes. Beginning in the middle of the 20th century, philosophers like Edmund Husserl and Maurice merleau ponty began to question these everyday assumptions using a new framework called phenomenology. They pointed out that human consciousness, and therefore the self, cannot exist in some abstract transcendental mind. All consciousness is derived from the experience of phenomena, and experience fundamentally depends on the body. Everything we know, everything we think, indeed our very sense of self, derives from our embodied experience in the world. The philosopher David Abram puts it in these poetic words. Without this body, without this tongue or these ears, you could neither speak nor hear another's voice, nor could you have anything to speak about, or even to reflect on, or to think, since without any contact, any encounter, without any glimmer of sensory experience, there could be nothing to question or to know. The living body is thus the very possibility of contact, not just with others, but with oneself the very possibility of reflection, of thought, of knowledge. Of course, none of this was particularly surprising to people who were already all too aware of their bodies, people, and particularly women, who depend on sometimes painful manual labor for their livelihood, be it in the fields or the factory or the home. But the rise of phenomenology marked the moment that Europe's elite men discovered that they had bodies, that they were not just reason in a vat. It collapsed the mind-body distinction once and for all. Once you accept this, it's a short step to recognizing that these other phenomena that populate our field of experience, the other beings with whom we engage, not just other humans but plants and animals as well, they are beings with subjective experience too. After all, they are bodies like us, sensing the world, engaging with it, responding to it, shaping it. In fact, the world that presents itself to us is co-created by other subjects, just as we co-create their world. We are all engaged with each other in a sensual dance of perception, 
an ongoing dialogue through which we come to know the world. When we think of it this way, suddenly the subject-object distinction collapses. Husserl argued that the universe of experience isn't defined by subject-object relations. Rather, it is an intersubjective field which is collectively produced. Everything we know, everything we think, everything we are, is shaped by mutual interaction with other subjects. These insights from phenomenology bring us remarkably close to what animists have so long insisted upon. After all, if we start from the belief that what makes humans special is the fact that they are subjects, then once we realize that non-human beings are subjects too, we're in completely new terrain. Suddenly, the boundaries of personhood stretch out well beyond the human community to encompass non-human others. I've mentioned Western thinkers here simply to show that there have always been minority reports, even within Western philosophy itself. But these ideas have been developed, practiced, and kept alive most fully by indigenous thinkers who have not been encumbered by Cartesian assumptions in the first place, such as the Honduran activist Berta Cáceres, who was assassinated in 2016 for defending the Rio Gualcarque the Inuit leader Sheila Watt-Cloutier, who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007, before it went to Al Gore, the Inuvialuit politician Rosemary Kuptana, and, to mention two people who have been particularly influential to me, the Algonquin scholar-activist Jack D. Forbes and the Potawatomi scientist and philosopher Robin Wall Kimmerer. Reading these people always reminds me of Aimé Césaire's words, which I mentioned towards the beginning of this book. Remember, Césaire described colonization as a process of thingification. Living beings, nature, and humans alike had to be rendered as objects so they could be legitimately exploited. This paved the way for cheap nature and capitalist growth. Given this history, it becomes clear that any process of decolonization must therefore begin with a process of de-thingification. This is what indigenous philosophers teach us, that we must learn to see ourselves once again as part of a broader community of living beings. If our approach to degrowth does not have this ethic at its heart, then we've missed the point. A Second Scientific Revolution In the late 20th century, Phenomenology managed to re-implant animist principles right into the heart of European philosophy, and science quickly followed. Over the past two decades, a cascade of scientific discoveries has started to radically change how we perceive ourselves in relation to the rest of the living world. Take bacteria, for instance. For generations, we were told that bacteria were bad, full stop. We armed ourselves with antibacterial soaps and chemical disinfectants and set out to purify our bodies and our homes and even our food of the invisible little enemies we call germs. But in recent years, scientists have overthrown many of those early misconceptions. Our gut, skin, and other organs are populated by trillions of microbial beings and it turns out that we depend on these little creatures for our very existence. Gut bacteria are vital for digestion as they break down food and turn it into nutrients we can use. They help regulate our immune responses. They're even essential to healthy brain function as they activate neural pathways and nervous system signaling mechanisms that help us deal with stress, prevent anxiety and depression, and promote mental health. They may even play a role in our social lives. Scientists have recently discovered that wiping out the microbiota in mice makes them behave in antisocial ways, and they anticipate that the same is likely to be true of humans. These facts utterly confound any clear distinctions between mind and body, human and nature. The assumptions that underpin dualist thought are disintegrating in the face of science. And it's not just bacteria. Even some viruses appear to be beneficial to us, like the phages that regulate bacterial populations. Without them, 
bacterial processes in our bodies could tip out of balance. If you were to count up all the cells that constitute your body, you'd find that more of them belong to other life forms than belong to you as such. Let this fact sink in, and it upends the way we think about ourselves. What is a self anyway if it cannot readily be distinguished from the trillions of other beings with whom we live, with whom we co-manage our physical and mental states, and without whom we cannot survive? As the British philosopher of science John Dupre has put it, these findings make it hard to claim that a creature is self-sufficient, or even that you can mark out where it ends and another one begins. Things get even stranger when we zoom out over evolutionary time. Humans have two sets of DNA: one contained in the nucleus of each of our cells, and the other in the mitochondria, an organelle that lives within the cell itself. Biologists believe that this second set, the mitochondrial DNA, is derived from bacteria that were engulfed by our cells at some point in the evolutionary past. Today, these little organelles play an absolutely essential role in human life. They convert food into energy that our bodies can use. This is mind-bending. That our most basic metabolic functions and even the genetic codes that constitute the very core of who we are depend on other beings. The implications of this are profound. A team of scientists associated with the interdisciplinary microbiome project at Oxford University have suggested that discoveries related to bacteria may revolutionize not only our science but our ontology too. Our ability to map previously invisible forms of microbial life in and around us is forcing us to rethink the biological constitution of the world and the position of humans vis-à-vis -vis other forms of life. Just as bacteria are revolutionizing how we think about our relationship with the world, biologists are also discovering some remarkable things about trees and forests that are upending how we think about plants. When we see a tree, we tend to think of it as a singular unit, just as we think of ourselves as individuals. But biologists have discovered that it's not quite so simple. They've come to understand that trees depend on certain kinds of fungi in the soil, hair-thin structures called hyphae, that interlace with cells in the roots of trees to form mycorrhiza. The fungi benefit by receiving some of the sugar that plants produce through photosynthesis, which it cannot otherwise make, while the trees benefit in turn by receiving elements like phosphorus and nitrogen that they cannot produce for themselves. And without which they cannot survive. But this reciprocity is not confined to just two parties in this ancient relationship. Invisible fungal networks also connect the roots of different trees to one another, sometimes over great distances, forming an underground internet that allows them to communicate and even to share energy, nutrients, and medicine. The ecologist Robert McFarlane explains how this works. A dying tree might divest itself of its resources to the benefit of the community, for example, or a young seedling in a heavily shaded understory might be supported with extra resources by its stronger neighbors. Even more remarkably, the network also allows plants to send one another warnings. A plant under attack from aphids can indicate to a nearby plant that it should raise its defensive response before the aphids reach it. It has been known for some time that plants communicate above ground in comparable ways by means of airborne hormones, but such warnings are more precise in terms of source and recipient when sent by means of the myconet. Trees cooperate; they communicate; they share, not only among members of the same species, but across species barriers. Douglas firs and birches. Feed each other, and it's not just trees. We know now that all plants, except for a handful of species, have this same relationship with mycorrhiza. Just as with our gut bacteria, these findings challenge how we think about the boundaries between species. 
Is a tree really an individual? Can it really be conceived as a separate unit? Or is it an aspect of a broader, multi-species organism? There's also something else going on here, something perhaps even more revolutionary. Dr. Suzanne Simard, a professor in the Department of Forest and Conservation at the University of British Columbia, has argued that mycorrhizal networks among plants operate like neural networks in humans and other animals. They function in remarkably similar ways, passing information between nodes. And, just as the structure of neural networks enables cognition and intelligence in animals, mycorrhizal networks provide similar capacities to plants. Recent research shows that the network not only facilitates transmission, communication and cooperation, just like our neurons do, it also facilitates problem-solving, learning, memory and decision-making. These words are not just metaphorical. The ecologist Monica Galliano has published groundbreaking research on plant intelligence, showing that plants remember things that happen to them and change their behavior accordingly. In other words, they learn. In a recent interview with Forbes, she insisted, My work is not about metaphors at all. When I talk about learning, I mean learning. When I talk about memory, I mean memory. Indeed, plants actively change their behavior as they encounter new challenges and receive messages about the changing world around them. Plants sense. They see, hear, feel, and smell, and they respond accordingly. If you've ever seen time-lapse footage of a vine growing up a tree, you'll have an idea of what this looks like in action. That vine is no automaton. It's sensing, moving, balancing, solving problems, trying to figure out how to navigate new terrain. The more we learn, the stranger, or perhaps more familiar, it all becomes. Simard's work shows that trees can recognize their own relatives through mycorrhizal networks. Older mother trees can identify nearby saplings that came from their own seeds, and they use this information to decide how to allocate resources in times of stress. Simard also describes how trees seem to have emotional responses to trauma in a way that's not dissimilar to animals. After a machete whack or during an aphid attack, their serotonin levels change. Yes, they have serotonin, along with a number of neurochemicals that are common in animal nervous systems, and they start pumping out emergency messages to their neighbors. Of course, none of this is to say that plant intelligence is exactly like that of animals. In fact, scientists warn that our urge to constantly compare the intelligence of some species with that of others is exactly the problem. It ends up blinding us to how other kinds of intelligence might work. Set out in search of a brain, and you'll never notice the mycorrhizae that have been pulsing through the earth, evolving right under our feet for 450 million years. This research is just taking off, and we have no idea where it might lead. But Simard is careful to point out that it's not exactly new. If you listen to some of the early teachings of the Coast Salish and the indigenous people along the western coast of North America, they knew about these insights already. It's in the writings and in the oral history. The idea of the mother tree has long been there, the fungal networks, the below-ground networks that keep the whole forest healthy and alive, that's also there. That these plants interact and communicate with each other, that's all there. They used to call the trees the tree people. Western science shut that down for a while, and now we're getting back to it. Trees aren't only connected with each other. They're also connected with us. Over the past few years, research into human-tree relationships has yielded some truly striking findings. A team of scientists in Japan conducted an experiment with hundreds of people around the country. They asked half of the participants to walk for 15 minutes through a forest and the other half to walk through an urban setting, and then they tested their emotional states. 
In every case, the forest walkers experience significant mood improvements when compared to the urban walkers, plus a decline in tension, anxiety, anger, hostility, depression, and fatigue. The benefits were immediate and effective. Trees also have an impact on our behavior. Researchers have found that spending time around trees makes people more cooperative, kinder, and more generous. It increases our sense of awe and wonder at the world, which in turn changes how we interact with others. It reduces aggression and incivility. Studies in Chicago, Baltimore, and Vancouver have all discovered that neighborhoods with higher tree cover have significantly fewer crimes, including assault, robbery, and drug use, even when controlling for socioeconomic status and other confounding factors. It's almost as though being with trees makes us more human. We don't quite know why this happens. Is it just that green environments are somehow more pleasant and calming? A study in Poland suggests that doesn't explain it. They had people spend 15 minutes standing in a wintertime urban forest. No leaves, no green, no shrubbery, just straight, bare trees. One might think such an environment would have minimal, if any, positive impact on people's mood, but not so. Participants standing in the bare forest reported significant improvements in their psychological and emotional states when compared to a control group that spent those 15 minutes hanging out in an urban landscape. And it's not just mood and behavior. It turns out that trees have an impact on our physical health, too, in concrete, material terms. Living near trees has been found to reduce cardiovascular risk. Walking in forests has been found to lower blood pressure, cortisol levels, pulse rates, and other indicators of stress and anxiety. Even more intriguingly, a team of scientists in China found that elderly patients with chronic health conditions demonstrated significant improvements in immune function after spending time in forests. We don't know for sure, but this may have something to do with the chemical compounds that trees exhale into the air. The aromatic vapors released by cypress, for example, have been found to enhance the activity of a number of human immune cells while reducing stress hormone levels. In an attempt to quantify the overall benefit of trees, scientists in Canada found that trees have a more powerful impact on our health and well-being than even large sums of money. Having just 10 more trees on a city block decreases cardiometabolic conditions in ways comparable to earning an extra $20,000 and it improves one's sense of well-being as much as earning an extra $10,000, moving to a neighborhood with $10,000 higher median income, or being seven years younger. These results are astonishing. There's a real mystery here which scientists still do not yet understand. But perhaps we shouldn't be so surprised. After all, we have co-evolved with trees for millions of years. We even share DNA with trees. After countless generations, we've come to depend on them for our health and happiness, just as we depend on other humans. We are, in a very real sense, relatives. These remarkable interdependencies, trees, fungi, Humans and bacteria are only the very tip of the iceberg. Ecologists are finding them literally everywhere. There's not a single ecosystem on the planet where species don't interact in mutually enriching ways. We're even starting to rethink the relationship between predators and their prey. In the past, we saw this as a matter of domination and plunder. Dog eat dog. The law of the jungle. Kill or be killed. And certainly, if you zoom in on discreet moments of predation, they can be quite gruesome, as you'll know if you've ever seen footage of a lion on the hunt. But zoom out, and it becomes clear that there's something else going on. Predation turns out to be more about balance and equilibrium than anything else. In Alaska, for example, wolves keep caribou populations in check. 
This prevents the caribou from overgrazing saplings, which in turn allows forests to grow and flourish. Forests prevent erosion, which keeps soils healthy and enables rivers to run clear. Good soils give rise to berries and grubs, while clear rivers provide habitats for fish and other freshwater creatures. Fish and berries and grubs in turn feed bears and eagles. These interdependencies build strength and resilience into ecosystems, literally fleshing out the network. But the cascades of generosity also work in reverse. In areas where wolves have been exterminated, whole ecosystems fall apart. Forests collapse, soils erode, rivers fill with silt, and eagles and bears disappear. Similar ecosystem dynamics have been described in every region of every continent, including at the poles. Nothing exists alone. Individuality is an illusion. Life on this planet is an interwoven mesh of relational becoming. There is even evidence that these principles operate at a planetary level between entire Earth systems processes. Scientists have been learning how plant, animal, and bacterial biomes interact with the land, the atmosphere, and the oceans in ways that regulate everything, from the temperature of the planet's surface to the salinity of the seas to the composition of the air. Our planet is one giant system of interlocking reciprocities. The British scientist James Lovelock has described the Earth as a superorganism, which automatically self-regulates in a manner that maintains the conditions for life, just as the human body self-regulates to keep internal systems in functional balance. This is the Gaia hypothesis, so named after the goddess of the Earth in Greek mythology. And indeed, these findings from Earth system science and biogeochemistry would not be surprising to peoples who have long regarded the Earth as a living being, or even as a mother. Post-capitalist ethics. What does all of this mean for us? How should we live in the light of this science? Let's go back to those findings about plants, just for the sake of argument. When research about plant intelligence first began circulating on social media, not everyone reacted well to it. If plants are intelligent, perhaps even conscious in some distributed sense, then how are we supposed to deal with the fact that harvesting crops must therefore be a kind of murder? How are we supposed to cut trees for furniture if it means splitting up a family? Thinking this way would make life so ethically fraught as to be practically impossible. For many people, this conundrum poses such a problem that they feel the only reasonable response is to reject the science itself. Interestingly, these are the very dilemmas that the Achua, Chuang, and other animist communities face, and perhaps we can take lessons from the answers they've arrived at after generations of thinking about it. There's nothing necessarily unethical about harvesting crops or cutting down trees, they say, or even hunting and eating animals, for that matter. What's unethical is to do so without gratitude and without reciprocity. What's unethical is to take more than you need and more than you give back. What's unethical is exploitation, extraction, and perhaps worse still, waste. Remember, for the Achua and Chuang, the key principle is reciprocity. You have to start by recognizing that you are in a relationship of interdependence. Robin Wall Kimmerer argues that the ethics of this exchange must begin from the awareness that we are engaging with sovereign beings. It is a relationship with persons who are deserving of our respect. Kimmerer points out. That we should receive food and materials from the living world with the same care and decorum and gratitude that we might receive a healthy home-cooked meal from our grandmother. We should treat what we receive not as a right, but as a gift. This is not just about uttering a thank you beneath our breath and moving on with our lives, although practicing even this simple act can completely change how we interact with the living world. It is much more than that. 
What's powerful about gifts is that they place us in a position of self-restraint, where we're careful to take no more than we need and no more than the other is able to share. This has intrinsic conservational value, and it's a radical act in the context of a culture that's hell-bent on consumption far beyond the point of excess. And, as any anthropologist will tell you, gifts also bind us into long-lasting covenants of reciprocal exchange. They force us to consider what we can give back in return. The gift lingers. If you've received a gift from someone, you won't accept another one until you've had a chance to give something back to them. In this sense, the logic of the gift is deeply ecological. It's about equilibrium, about balance. Indeed, it's how ecosystems maintain themselves. All of this runs exactly against the logic of capitalism. Capitalism ultimately relies on a single overarching principle. Take more than you give back. We've seen this logic in action for 500 years, beginning with enclosure and colonization. In order to accumulate surplus, you have to extract uncompensated value from nature and bodies, which must be objectified and rendered as external. So what would it mean to extend the principles of reciprocity beyond the individual interactions that we might have with plants and animals and ecosystems? What would it mean to govern a whole economic system by these rules? Interestingly, ecological economists are already taking steps in this direction. Remember, the key principle of ecological economics is to run the economy in steady state to extract no more than can be regenerated, and to waste no more than can be safely absorbed. The Achua and Chuang would find a lot to resonate with here. How can we know what those thresholds are? That's where ecologists come in. Ecology is a unique branch of science in that it seeks not only to understand the parts of a system, but how those parts relate to one another in a broader whole. Ecologists are adept at understanding and even managing ecosystem health. They are, in some crucial respects, like shamans. Drawing on insights from ecologists, whether their expertise comes from university training or from long-standing engagement with the land, we can determine how many trees can be felled, how many fish can be fished, and how much ore can be mined without tipping ecosystems out of balance, and we can set limits and quotas accordingly. Better yet, we can switch to methods that don't just minimize harm, but actively regenerate ecosystems. This is where the reciprocity part comes in, and it's where things get particularly exciting. Take farming, for instance. Modern industrial farms are built as vast monocultures, with a single crop stretching from horizon to horizon, doused in chemical pesticides and herbicides designed to exterminate all all other forms of life. If you've ever seen aerial photographs of the American Midwest, you know what this looks like. Under capitalist agriculture, the land is reorganized according to a totalitarian logic with a single goal in mind, to maximize short-term extraction. This approach has turned rich topsoils into dust, releasing huge plumes of CO2 from the earth in the process. It's caused insect and bird populations to collapse, while chemical runoff has killed whole freshwater ecosystems. Fortunately, there's another way. Intrepid farmers around the world, from Virginia to Syria, are experimenting with more holistic methods called regenerative agroecology. They're planting multiple crop species together to build resilient ecosystems while using compost, organic fertilizers and crop rotation to restore life and fertility to the soils. In areas where these methods have been used, crop yields have improved, earthworms have returned, insect populations have recovered and bird species have rebounded. And perhaps best of all, as dead soils recover, they're sequestering enormous quantities of CO2 out of the atmosphere. In fact, scientists believe that if we're going to have any chance of averting climate breakdown, we'll need to roll out regenerative methods across most of the world's farmland and pasture. 
it's more effective by far than any man-made carbon capture technology. This is what reciprocity looks like in action. When you give back as much as you receive, it has a multiplier effect on ecosystem health. It revives life. And it's not just in agriculture that this is happening. Regenerative approaches are being developed in forestry and fishing as well. And in many cases, people are drawing on techniques that have long been used by indigenous communities and small farmers in the global south. Large agribusinesses have been slow to adopt these methods, however, despite the fact that they've been shown to improve the quality of crops and the long-term fertility of the soils. Why? Because it requires time and labor. It requires an intimate knowledge of the local ecosystem. It requires understanding the traits and behaviors of dozens of species and how they interact with each other. It requires care. When you treat a farm like an ecosystem instead of a factory, you begin a relationship with the land that is inimical to the short-term extractivist logic of agribusiness. Some communities are taking these principles even further. Instead of just encouraging reciprocity with ecosystems, they're giving nature the rights of legal personhood. If this sounds wild, take a minute to remember that we already give personhood status to certain non-human entities, namely corporations. This is a twisted view of personhood that privileges accumulation over life itself. We can flip this logic around. Instead of giving personhood to Exxon and Facebook, we can give legal recognition to living beings. Why not redwoods? Why not rivers? Why not whole watersheds? Over the past few years, a series of extraordinary court decisions in New Zealand has caused an international stir. In 2017, the Thwanganui River, the country's third longest river, which the Maori people have long considered to be sacred, was declared a legal person. It is now recognized as an indivisible and living whole from the mountains to the sea incorporating both its physical and metaphysical elements. The Maori have been fighting for this since 1870. In the words of Gerard Albert, the lead negotiator, we consider the river an ancestor, and always have. And it's not just the river. In the same year, courts gave similar legal standing to Mount Taranaki, which towers over the island's west coast. A few years prior, the Te Uruwera National Park was made a legal entity, no longer to be owned by the government as state property, but rather to be owned by itself. Following the New Zealand decision, the Ganges and Yamuna rivers in India were given legal rights. All the corresponding rights, duties and liabilities of a living person. In Colombia, the Supreme Court granted legal rights to the Amazon River. Going forward, any act that harm these rivers can technically be prosecuted in much the same way that we might prosecute harms perpetrated against humans. Some countries have gone further still. Ecuador's 2008 constitution establishes the rights of nature itself to exist, persist, maintain and regenerate its vital cycles. Two years later, Bolivia passed the Law of the Rights of Mother Earth recognizing that Mother Earth is the dynamic living system formed by the indivisible community of all life systems and living beings who are interrelated, interdependent, and complementary, which share a common destiny. While some worry that these rights may turn out to be more rhetorical than real, there is nonetheless a lot of potential here, and they've already been successfully invoked in some cases to stop big industrial projects that might harm rivers and watersheds. Can we extend this approach even more broadly to encompass the whole planet? Some people think so. There's a movement of indigenous communities and their allies to get a universal declaration of the rights of Mother Earth formally adopted by the UN General Assembly. The draft declaration says that the Earth should have the right to life and to exist, the right to be respected, the right to regenerate its biocapacity and to continue its vital cycles and processes. 
At the same time, a growing movement of scientists is calling for a framework of Earth systems governance, recognizing that major planetary processes like the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, ocean currents, forests, the ozone layer, and so on, need to be protected in order to maintain the conditions for life. And because all of these processes traverse human-created borders, protecting them requires cooperation beyond the nation-state. Less is more. All of this represents the beginning of a profound shift in consciousness. There's something about the ecological crisis that seems to be opening us to new ways of thinking, or rather beckoning us to older ways of thinking, about our relationship with the more-than-human world. This takes us straight to the core of the problem. It gestures towards how we might begin to heal the rift from which this crisis has ultimately sprung. It empowers us to imagine a richer, more fertile future, a future free from the old dogmas of capitalism and rooted instead in reciprocity with the living world. The ecological crisis requires a radical policy response. We need high-income countries to scale down excess energy and material use. We need a rapid transition to renewables. And we need to shift to a post-capitalist economy that's focused on human well-being and ecological stability, rather than on perpetual growth. But we also need more than this. We need a new way of thinking about our relationship with the living world. How can we possibly bring all of these together? When I set out to write this book, I worried about using degrowth as a central frame. It is only a first step, after all. But as I think about the journey we've been on, I wonder if it is also more than that. Degrowth stands for decolonization of both lands and peoples and even our minds. It stands for the de-enclosure of commons, the de-commodification of public goods, and the de-intensification of work and life. It stands for the de-thingification of humans and nature, and the de-escalation of ecological crisis. Degrowth begins as a process of taking less, but in the end it opens up whole vistas of possibility. It moves us from scarcity to abundance, from extraction to regeneration, from dominion to reciprocity, and from loneliness and separation to connection with a world that's fizzing with life. Ultimately, what we call the economy is our material relationship with each other and with the rest of the living world. We must ask ourselves, what do we want that relationship to be like? Do we want it to be about domination and extraction? Or do we want it to be about reciprocity and care? There is a tree that stands outside the window of the room in London where I write. It's an enormous chestnut that whirls confidently out of the earth and casts its generous branches nearly five stories high. The species has been around for some 80 million years, having somehow survived the last mass extinction event. This particular tree is 500 years old and one of the last remnants of an ancient forest that has long since been destroyed. It has stood as witness to the whole story that I've described in these pages. It was there even before the enclosure movement began, when the land from which its roots draw sustenance was still a commons unencumbered by title or deed. It has stood there season after season as industrial emissions pour into the sky. It has felt the temperatures rise and watched the insects and birds that live amongst its leaves slowly disappear. I often wonder what this quiet giant will witness in the decades and centuries ahead during our lifetime and the lifetimes of the generations that will follow. How will the rest of the story unfold? It is within our power to write a different future, if we can summon the courage to do so. We have everything to lose, and a world to gain. We hope you've enjoyed this audio production of Less is More by Jason Hickel.